So I'm just going to talk about selective dorsal rhizotomy versus intrathecal baclofen. There's some other stuff. Um, I mean, we could talk about that some other time. I will touch a little bit on ventral rhizotomies, which we're doing here as well. Um, they seem to be very effective in terms of managing um, dystonic uh, cerebral palsy. Um, this comes from a paper looking at non-ambulant children. Should you do rhizotomies or should you do a pump? And the answer is, eh, not sure. Um, and as with most spasticity literature, it's really difficult to measure outcomes. So let's start with selective dorsal rhizotomy. This is an intraoperative picture. The dura is open. The nerve roots of the cauda equina are exposed. Here's the silastic sheeting we use to segregate the dorsal from the ventral rootlets. And this is a pair of micro scissors and a micro hook splitting a fascicle in half so that we could test each one. The physiologic basis of a selective dorsal rhizotomy. Here's a circuit. These are the spinal motor neurons here hanging out down in the lumbar spine. Y represents the proprioceptive input from the legs in this case. And this is an ongoing flood of information. I mean, if you think about it, all the muscles and joints in your body are con consistently giving your brain an update on where they are and what they're doing. Um, and to manage that information, to tame that flood, you have to have descending input from the cerebrum and the cerebellum and even from the brainstem to modulate that information or it gets a bit out of hand. And the output of those motor neurons, Z, is roughly equivalent to what's coming in, Y, and modulated or divided by X. So if you have supraspinal injury, for instance, cerebral palsy, you lose that descending input, it's decreased. So there's less modulation of the complicated motor neuron circuits uh, and that proprioceptive flood uh, is untamed. Additionally, when this supraspinal modulation of the motor neuron circuits is decreased, those motor neurons start to look for, well, at least we think, right? that they start to look for this supraspinal input and they might even turn up the gain. So not only is Y unmodulated, the motor neurons start to turn up the gain to look for that Y. I'm sorry, to look for that X, um, but increasing that sensitivity to X probably also increases the sensitivity to Y. So not only is it unmodulated, we're actually sort of giving it a larger voice um, in those motor neuron lives. And so the motor neurons become more responsive to Y and the outflow Z increases. And this is the, this is the basis of the exaggerated motor outflow causing hyperreflexia, clonus, reflex overflow into the upper extremities and even into the head um, and a Babinski sign. So here's a taking that information and putting it into something more anatomically familiar. Y represents the neurologic pathway from muscle spindles carrying proprioceptive information. And so the, the wonder was back in the day, hey, maybe if you cut the dorsal rootlets, you can decrease Y and turn down Z. Um, and they initially actually cut them all and they found that um, complete deafferentiation caused a central nervous system remodeling that had long-term dystonic consequences. So they stopped doing that. That's why we do some of them and not all of them. So here at University of Louisville, Norton Children's Hospital, all of our selective dorsal rhizotomy patients are screened by uh, physical therapists with a really deep experience with these patients. Um, all muscle groups in the lower extremities are graded. This is where the difficulty comes in. Cause I mean, I don't really, you know with all due respect to my physical medicine and rehab colleagues I call it the ash worthless scale. Um, I mean, because in the literature, it's demonstrably not valid <laughs> and it's not reproducible. Um, so we use this thing called a functional impairment score. I don't know that it's better. Um, the physical therapists that I work with at the kids center when they're doing the mapping seem to like it better. Um, and all I'm looking for is how much is that muscle group messing with the kid? Um, so zero would be no functional impairment. One is mild, two moderate, and three severe. Um, certainly no studies. I don't know that this is better than the ash worthless. It just seems a little bit more straightforward. How much is it getting in the way? So I get a, a map like this um, from the physical therapist and they come to the operating room. This is up on a board. 
Uh, and we have our uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring, IONM. Um, I only use one company, it's Evokes. Uh, we use a bipolar stimulator um, and they have a very detailed neurophysiological stimulation protocol, uh, which grew out of an incident about 10 years ago in which they had a really bad outcome with a kid at Cincinnati. So they literally kind of toured the country and looked for best practice and put together their own, um, their own um, protocol. Uh, I mean, this, this seems to be a protocol that was generated by a response of, oh, hell no, that ain't ever happening again. Um, and so we have a neurophysiologist looking at the electrophysiologic signature of a tested nerve rootlet. Um, and then there's another uh, member under the drapes who's, you know, looking at what the legs are doing, looking what, you know, how are the muscles responding? Is there in fact, you know, uh, on an observable level a bilateral response, that kind of thing. Uh, and we found over time that this is really, um, really, we're really able to identify nerve roots, um, which is a big deal. Um, so we find we're able, reliably identifying nerve rootlets by its electrophysiologic signature. We're reliably finding the neurophysiologic signature of rootlets that are responsible for clinically relevant impairments of function. And we're reliably finding normal roots that should not be cut, which is a big deal because the main method that's out there, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know how often people are delving into the specifics of the neurophysiological guidance of selective dorsal rhizotomy, but the main method Method is a monopolar method described by Park, uh, and you know any neurosurgeon who's got some experience with this understands how frustrating it is. Because I was in the operating room and I touched my nerve rootlet and I get an answer of oh this stimulates four muscle groups and one on the contralateral side, and then I put the nerve rootlet down and I pick it up again and be like oh this is stimulating two muscle groups which is functionally normal, uh, and you pick it up again you get a third answer. So you really do, I developed no no confidence in this. And a guy named Paul Steinbach, who's a neurosurgeon in, in British Columbia, uh, did this study. And his conclusions are there's no advantage of doing selective dorsal rhizotomy um, with uh, electrophysiologic guidance compared to no electrophysiologic guidance. Um, rhizotomy can reasonably be done in centers where this guidance is not available, but electrophysiological simulation to avoid, to distinguish dorsal from ventral roots may be useful. That's super useful. Sometimes the ventral roots sneak in there and you don't want that at all. Uh, so, you know, I'd given up hope for a while and I was just sort of randomly cutting these dorsal nerve rootlets. Um, but then we started using evokes, uh, and we had, this was a really pivotal moment in 2019. We had a kid come in with a symmetric spasticity of the lower extremities. So here's the email from Dr. Schuster, pre SDR, his tone does appear to be symmetrical and we were going through and we're testing these rootlets. And we find that on the right side, 81% had um, ipsilateral snarkiness, which means uh, an electrophysiologic signature that indicates that they might justifiably be cut. Uh, and 48% had snark, I'm sorry, 48% had snarkiness on the other side. But on the left side, we found that only 45% had ipsilateral snarkiness and only, and, and well, 10% had contralateral. So we ended up doing this very asymmetrical bilateral rhizotomy. And the outcome was a symmetric reduction in his tone, um, which is a which is kind of a big deal because you know most of the controversies over selective dorsal rhizotomy uh, are on, you know, should you actually do a big laminoplasty so you could very specifically cut specific um, percentages of the nerve roots at each level. Um, and I would say that this probably is not an optimal strategy um, that, you know, that this, that this method actually sort of allows us to really identify sick from not sick root, uh, roots, rootlets. And, and I'll, by and large, when we put together our neurophysiologic aggregate signatures for the patient, it really matches that preoperative mapping really well. So does it work? Um, this is a review from 2019. The um, Scandinavians and Dutch are really into spasticity research, um, and they put together this. Um, the Swede, the Swede, uh, the Swedes put together this review. Um, at 10 years or more follow-up, available studies generate low-level evidence with considerable bias. No functional improvement of SDR over routine therapy is documented. Furthermore, the long-term effects of SDR with respect to spasticity reduction is unclear with many studies reporting a high amount of add-on spasticity treatment. More long-term follow-up using robust scientific protocols is required before it can be decided whether this should be routine therapy, right? So um, the literature is not 
that high on it, I'm, I will make this comment. I mean, so we still do it, right? And I would think that most of my physical therapy and, and, and orthopedic and neurology and, and rehab colleagues are, you know, pretty enthusiastic about selective dorsal rhizotomies and how they help kids. So I, I think it's really hard to know literature wise, whether this is an effective operation. So they're bad outcome measures. It's the Ash worthless scale. Patients are super hard to categorize. I mean, you know, it's 86 billion neurons and some of them are picked off in a manner that gives you cerebral palsy. How do you categorize patients? I mean, even even different injuries on the same gyrus are likely to give you a similar clinical picture, but they'd really be different injuries. Um, and then there, it, it, what I'll call idiosyncratic plasticity changes. So these, you know, every one of these patients, even if they have identical injuries to their neurons and white matter, um, how they experience their lives in the two to five years it takes to consider a selective dorsal rhizotomy, that their plasticity is different. So even if you have an identical injury, which is almost impossible, but even if you have an identical injury, um, how you compensate for that over time is going to change your functionality um, and change how we might measure you know, your outcome from a selective dorsal rhizotomy. So, you know, I, I really wrestle with this, you know, because the literature is like, meh, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, um, you know, but but what I find over and over um, is something that's echoed by um, Miss Heather Woolridge here and her, she's talking about her daughter, Callie. Let's see what happens if I click this. Huh? Hi, my name is Heather. My daughter is Callie and she has several palsy and dystonia. She has very, or had very rigid movements, um, very spastic, could hardly get around and her speech was very jumbled. In 2019, Dr. Munchnick performed a dorsal and ventral rhizotomy. We, as parents, did not know what a rhizotomy was, so we Google searched that. We do not recommend. When it came time to have the surgery, my husband and I were still very concerned. Like I said, we didn't truly understand what a rhizotomy was, didn't really know what to expect. Well, two years later, and a lot of therapy later, here we are. Callie can take full steps assisted by simply a gate belt. She can crawl. We <clears throat> she can sit crisscross applesauce, as I say at school. Um, I have included two pictures, a before and an after. And all I can simply say is thank you very much, Dr. Munchnick. And, 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 and I mean, you know, I did the surgery and made sure her incision um, resolved, but really, you know, she you know, she, she made this video for me. I mean, it's really thank you to the team, right? I mean, to identify a child with spasticity who's amenable to a, a dorsal rhizotomy, but then also be able to identify um, and, and map out the level of dystonia, um, you know, is absolutely, is absolutely crucial. Um, and so, um, you know, I realize this is a bit of a focus on dorsal rhizotomy, but ventral rhizotomy is sort of an increasingly um, attractive uh, option. And I just did a, uh, a not so selective palliative uh, dorsal and ventral rhizotomy on a real, uh, you know, on a, on a, on a very not mobile child. And, and you know, their, their parents are pleased as punch. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 it makes, it seems to make a difference despite what the literature says. And this is what, this is what guides the neurosurgical portion of, of, you know, of this kind of treatment for cerebral palsy children. Um, so I'll move from rhizotomies to intrathecal baclofen pumps. Um, pumps are tough. Um, this is the baclofen molecule. It's basically GABA with a lipophilic chlorophenyl group attached to it. Um, it's mechanism of action. I'm gonna take a look at the, we're gonna take a look at the inserts so that the next slide is gonna show detail here, right? So you've got the cortical, maybe I've got a, Oh, there's no way to point, so sorry. So you got the corticospinal pathway in green, you've got the inhibitory interneuron in orange, and you've got the motor neuron in a darker orange down the lower left. And so, you know, you give baclofen and it binds to GABA-B receptors. And when it binds presynaptically on the corticospinal pathway neurons, um, it decreases the excitatory glutamate release. So there's just less glutamate. It also acts postsynaptically, inhibiting formation of acogen potential. So it just basically turns down 
the motor neuron, regardless of the abnormal milieu. So I, I have learned, I've searched long and hard for why it is that intrathecal, like why would Baclofen put right into the central nervous system at much higher levels, um, somehow have less central nervous system effects? And the answer is, I have no idea, um, but it does. Um, oral Baclofen is rapidly absorbed. It doesn't really cross the blood brain barrier very well. Um, you know, so 30 to 90 milligrams per day PO only results in plasma levels of 68 to 650 nanograms are highly variable um, and the correspond oh I'm sorry that gives you plasma levels of 68 to 650 the corresponding CSF levels are only 12 to 95 nanograms per milliliters and the side effects are a considerable problem um, drowsiness fatigue dizziness and weakness so if you put it directly into the fecal space you get 400 micrograms a day intrathecally and you get CSF levels that are essentially 400 microgram uh, nanograms um, plasma baclofen levels are virtually undetectable and you get way higher CSF levels with way fewer side effects. But there are some significant complications. Um, infections are quoted between 15 and 20%, fluid collections 15 to 25%, readmission within 30 days of a pump placement is about 7.5%. Um, there's a really high rate of occult hydrocephalus, right? So you can have low grade elevated intracranial pressure in these kids. And you wouldn't know. I mean, how would you know, right? They've got so many neurological abnormalities. It's a little hard to tell if they've got a headache. Um, and so when I do my lumbar punctures for the testos, I always test um, opening pressure. And I would say at least 50% have elevated pressures. Uh, and they have significant nutritional and Im immunological issues. And when you have a brain injury that bad, your body cannot tend to itself as well as it does otherwise. Um, there, I think this is actually kind of an unexplored universe here. Um, and I've tried to actually figure out how to optimize probiotics prior to implantation, but there's not a lot of literature. But I mean, it's clear, you know, the gut micro of children with CP and epilepsy consuming a liquid diet had elevated levels of symbiotic pathogens and diminished intestinal barrier protection bacteria relative to a, a, a general diet group. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, not only does this cause GI dysfunction, I think it also, um, it also stresses their immune systems out and makes them less able to, to direct their energies to just healing. Um, you know, after a few years of practice, we put together a very demanding baclofen pump protocol. Um, if their baclofen test is positive, um, then we do an extensive lab workup. Um, we also get dental clearance. Kids like this hide a lot of chronic infections in their mouths. Uh, I just had a kid who had uh, an extensive dental extraction because of her, uh, because her uh, tooth decay was so bad. Um, new way I get nutrition and feeding evaluations on everybody. If they're at, you know, home of the innocence, they, they get that on a routine basis, but a lot of these kids live at home and it's a pretty taxing. And so I make sure they go and see our, our people and, and often they need a few months of work before they're optimized. Uh, and there's some very, very strict peri and post-operative protocols to make sure these go in safely. Uh, and, you know, back to this, right, back to the literature. So effects of continuous intrathecal baclofen therapy in children, a systematic review from 2019. And again, really discouraging language, despite three decades of applying intrathecal baclofen in children and a relatively large number of studies investigating the treatment effects, a direct link has not yet been demonstrated because of the low scientific quality of the primary studies. Further research, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, my response to frustration is to fantasize about jumping off the helipad. Um, these are high risk operations. They go wrong a lot. They're a lot of work. Um, you know, taking care of these kids is a lot of work and getting them ready is a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, if the literature outcomes are questionable, why do it? And it comes back to this. So instead of a parent this time, let's hear from Dr. Heather Huxel, who's the medical director of Home of the Innocence. What does she say about it? At the Home of the Innocence, we've had several families who have gotten the baclofen pump, and it's been a good fit for the patient. Um, I think it's especially a good option for families who are wanting for the control, and they've kind of maxed out on enteral medications um, and other uh, lesser or more reversible treatments. Um, we've had kids with both who are born with congenital or um, genetic anomalies and have spasticity issues, as well as kids who were more typical children than had a traumatic brain injury. Um, we've had both those sets of patients benefit from the pump in the past. 
Um, in some situations, we've had kids who've been able to wean off some of their respiratory needs because once their spasticity was more controlled, um, they had less agitation and we found that they needed less um, interventions from other body systems, um, such as PRN medications and respiratory management. So uh, we've had several patients who've had good success from the pump. Another nice thing about the baclofen pump is that when families go for the evaluation, um, they really get a chance to sit down with the neurosurgeon and talk about best options. Um, oftentimes, we often get input from the pediatric orthopedic surgeon as well as that child's physical and occupational therapist. So they really get a well-rounded evaluation to decide if the pump is the best treatment. And I think that meeting alone oftentimes gives the family a lot of clarity about where they want to go. So I find the evaluation for the pump to also be very beneficial. You know, for the back of pumps, my, my experience of them is that the, like 80% of the time people are incredibly thankful. I had a, a young man uh, several years ago who actually it got infected um, and it had to come out. So this kid kind of went through the, the ringer a bit and he definitely had comprehension. I mean, he was sort of an expressive and, and motor um, inhibited guy and a lot of comprehension. So he knew what was going on. Uh, and we, you know, I took that pump out and, you know, he came back to my office three months later, treated effectively. He's like, you put that back in me. Um, and people love people. It is a Christmas miracle um, for, for a good number of people. So, you know, I don't understand why the literature is so far off from my personal experience, but, but that's All right, you froze on that last statement, Dr. Munchik, but uh, so sorry about that. But overall, just a fantastic talk. Uh, it's also great to get Dr. Huxel's opinion. You know, um, Dr. Harris, who spoke earlier, and her both work at the Home of the Innocents, and a lot of those patients have really benefited from pump. So I totally agree. I think the literature, for some reason, <laughs> doesn't play out what we feel like we see with our eyes. So um, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, 